Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, first and foremost, I pray that you would forgive me of my sins and Lord, uh, give me the strength to present this message on your behalf. I am unworthy and just, uh, Lord, ask that you would take the reins of the work into your own hands and you would put words in my mouth that would glorify your name and forgive me of my failures and in spite of me, Lord, I pray that you would not hold my shortcomings against your people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> time of trouble. That's an important time, isn't it? Our first Bible quote is Daniel chapter 1. This is where we find out about the time of trouble and what this time of trouble is like. Daniel chapter 1, excuse me, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time, now notice this. How many times has time been used here? You have, and at that time. So there's a specific event, right? Mm -hmm. Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble. That's two times, right? such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same what? Time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now listen, friends, this is the end of the story. And the word time is used four times in this little quote right here. Friends, do you think that God would use this term that we need to be ready for this time if he wasn't going to let us know what the time was all about? You understand, if you have the event wrong, you have the time wrong. Isn't that true? Can you think of any more important thing than to be ready to tell others about being ready and to, and to tell others about helping to get ready. A time of trouble since there was never a nation, even to that same time. In other words, it's going to be very troublous. Let's just meditate on this for a second here. Let's talk about some times of trouble, okay? What happened during World War II? That was a time of trouble. And friends, if you were in Europe during World War II, that was very troublous times. We're talking about concentration camps, starvation, war, death, bloodshed. That was a really bad time, was it not? Especially over in Europe. And this is going to make that look like not so bad a time. This is going to be an event that people are going to be needing to be prepared for. Now, it says here that everyone that shall be found written in the book. So the people that are delivered are going to be written in the book. And so our job is to tell people, you know, you really need to be written in this book. A friend of mine, uh, he worked on a, a, a resort island, and the resort island had, uh, it was an exclusive island, super, super exclusive resort island, only for the rich and famous, okay? And it was uh, an island, it's, a, it's in the Caribbean, and it has its own airstrip, okay? And so when you go to this resort, you get on this chartered jet and you fly into the island and everything is included. I mean, it's just amazing, right? You have servants 
waiting on you hand and foot, uh, everything, beck and call. And so this resort has hundreds of people and they're on this island and they're just there to service uh, uh, the people on the, uh, at this resort. Now, uh, what they've done is they've built this little town, okay? And so you have, um, you have the employees of the resort, the day-to-day -day employees, and then the people that live in the town, they have service businesses. In other words, they supply fresh fish to the resort or ground, you know, they're contractors, so to speak, right? And so my friend was an employee of this resort, and he um, got the word one day that a really super powerful Category 5 hurricane was getting ready to hit this resort. And this resort uh, island was about a mile and a half wide and about a half a mi uh, ha mile and a half long and a half a mile wide and flat as a pancake. Okay? So what is, what's going to happen with the storm surge? It's just going to go right over it. People are going to be lost. Houses are going to be lost the whole nine yards. So what happened was uh, the resort, the, uh, the company, had to act very quickly because it needed to get the uh, people that were visiting the resort and the, um, and the employees of the resort off the island because this is not going to be good. And so um, everybody was issued these special tickets or these special passes because they had this book. If you're an employee and you're a guest, if you're not in the book, you can't get on the plane. Right? So the plane, you know, this, this uh, runway is uh, big, but it's not big for a huge jumbo jet. So they got the biggest jet they could get in there, like a medium-sized plane. It lands and all, you know, and the storm's coming. It's barreling down. And the uh, employees are lined up on the tarmac. The guests are lined up on the tarmac. And everybody gets on the plane, and the plane is full. And my friend said he'll never forget it as long as he lives. The plane shuts the door, and it starts taking off down the runway. And who's standing on the side of the one runway with their luggage? The people that live in the little town that's servicing the resort because there's no room on the plane for them and there's no other plane coming. You understand what's happening here? It means certain death and there's nobody that can help them. And if you're not in that plane, if you're not written in that book, that's it. And the plane takes off and the people are just standing there, lined up along, hoping that they were going to get on board, but their names weren't written in the book. And friends, this is coming. This is coming. And so what we want to do, friends, our, what our job is, is to get their names in the book. And what's going to help get their names in the book is when they see these events coming to fulfillment, it's going to wake them up to the times that we're living in, and they're going to want to get their name in that book. Amen? Amen. And we want to be in that book too, right? Now let's talk about this book and whose name goes in it. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16 to 18. Malachi chapter 3 verses 16 to 18. Then they that feared the Lord. Who? They, they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord. And they taught upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day, what day is he talking about? The same day. When I make up my jewels and I will swear, spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between righteousness and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. That is who goes in the book. Do you fear God? Do you serve God? And fear the Lord is beginning of wisdom, right? And who is it that fears the Lord? Those that keep his commandments. Amen? 
This is the judgment hour cry, friends. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And this is what Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 is all about. It's the conclusion of the judgment message. Because you know what happens in verse 1 there? Michael stands up, human probation ends, in a time of trouble, and you will not be delivered unless you're in the book. Right? If you're not in the book, by the time the time of trouble comes, it's just like that plane taken off the runway. There's no other plane coming. Revelation chapter 20, 12 and 13. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened. Now notice this. Check this out here. I don't know if you've ever looked at this closely. Books were opened, plural. And another book was opened. So you have books are opened, and another book, singular, is opened which is the book of life. So you have these books, and then you have this book, which is called the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the books. So there are these books, and the people are being judged by the things that are written in the books. And if you are in the book of life, you're safe. Let's read on. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So you have this book of life where your name is written, and then you have this other book, and what is it? It's a book where your works are written down. Friends, are you seeing the whole thing? Remember in my story, if you didn't work for the company, you couldn't, couldn't get on the plane. Mm. Friends, at the end of the world, if we're not working for Jesus, if we're not submitted to Him, and this is not, I'm not talking about working for your salvation. That's already been paid for. Okay? I'm talking about working for souls. If you're not working for Jesus, you're not getting on the plane. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14 and 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Do you know we're supposed to be given this message? This is a judgment message, friends, because we're in the judgment right now. This is not a smooth method, message. This is no smooth message. But listen, friends, it's no smooth time that we're heading into. We're talking about a time of trouble such as there never was ever, ever, never. And if you're not in that book, you don't have a ticket out of here. It's a free ride. Your seat's already been paid for. I'll say this. It, did you know it's harder to be lost than to be saved? It's harder to be lost than to be saved. If you ever did any building like I have you'll realize that if you don't do the foundation right, <laughs> everything else is going to be harder. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Nothing's going to work. It seems easy, but believe me, it is harder to be lost. Now, let's get to the meat of the matter. These events are coming very, very quickly. And we're told that we have to give the warning to the whole entire world. Which means that it has to be done in a certain way. And this is what I want to talk about now. 
We've laid this principle out here that this time is coming. It's very important to be written in this book, and we need to encourage other people to be written in this book because of this time that's coming. And it's a specific time surrendered, sur surrounded or centered around specific events. Now let's look at the principles of how we do this and get it done. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses, actually it should be 1 through 4. We'll, we'll get to the next part here in 4. But let's see what the Bible says. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. You know, we're told in the book of Daniel that at the time of the end that we'll be running to and fro. Did you know that? No. And so we'll be running to and fro. Things are going to be really fast paced and we need to make the message plain so that it, you can run as you read. That means that our message is not to be overly and super complex. Right. It's to be hard-hitting and right to the point. Minimizing your reproof. Yes. It goes on. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. There's that word time again. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. That is a whole nother sermon right there. But the point I brought this quote in here with is that it's going to be a fast-paced thing and we have to make it plain because the work is going to go out quickly. This is from uh, GW92, Gospel Workers 92, page 179, paragraph 3. Listen to what the prophet says. The plan of Christ's teaching should be ours. He was plain and simple, striking directly at the root of the matter. And minds of awe were met. It is not the best policy to be so very explicit and say all upon a point that can be said. When a few arguments will cover the ground and be sufficient for all practical purposes to convince or silence opponents, you may remove every prop today and close the mouths of objectors so that they can say nothing, and tomorrow they will go over the same ground again. What this is basically talking about, friends, is if you have uh, one or two quotes to substantiate your position, if they're not going to accept those quotes, they're not going to accept a thousand quotes. And what they're going to do is they're going to bleed off all your time trying to meet these objections. And, and when we go into a place and give the message, if they don't accept it, what are we supposed to do? Dust your feet, move on. Why? Because we have a world to warn. Let's read on. She goes on. Listen to what she says. Thus it will be over and over, because they do not love the light and will not come to the light, lest their darkness and error should be removed from them. It is a better plan to keep a reserve of arguments than to pour out a depth of knowledge upon a subject which would be taken for granted without labored argument. Christ's ministry lasted only three years, and a great work was done in a short period. In these last days, there is a great work to be done in a short time. While many are getting ready to do something, souls will perish for the light and knowledge. If men who are engaged in presenting and defending the truth of the Bible 
undertake to investigate and show the fallacy and inconsistency of men who dishonestly turn the truth of God into a lie, Satan will stir up opponents enough to keep their pens constantly employed while other branches of the work will be left to suffer. Friends, it isn't our job to continually be arguing with these people that aren't accepting the word of God it's Satan's plan that we get caught up in these arguments and we just become like a dog chasing our tail, going round and round and round. And meanwhile, what happens? You're not getting the message out there. We must have more of the spirit of those men who were engaged in building the walls of Jerusalem. We are doing a great work and cannot come down. If Satan can keep men answering the objections of opponents and thus keep their voices silent and hinder them from doing the most important work for the present time, his object is accomplished. Mm -hmm. Friends, how many of us are getting into arguments with people all the time on this point, this point, this point? Come on. According to the prophet, this is what Satan wants. Why do you think there's 20 different scenarios to the events that lead to the close of probation? Who's brought this in? The world needs labor now. Remember, the, this is about Nehemiah. They're building the wall. I can't come down. The world needs labor now. Calls are coming in from every direction like the Macedonian cry. Come over and help us. And look what she says. Plain, pointed arguments standing out like mileposts will do more towards convincing minds generally than will a large array of arguments which cover a great deal of ground but which none but investigating minds will, be, will have interest to follow. I'm going to tell you right now, if there are individuals or groups of individuals that have these messages that are so complex, so deep, so intricate. They are not doing the work that the Lord would have done, friends. Because our work is to be simple, is to be simplistic, is to be plain, is to be the point. And we don't need a large array of arguments. You know why? Because it's not us that's going to carry the argument, friends. It's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit attends to the truth, and it brings conviction. The Holy Spirit doesn't need a billion arguments. The only thing we have to do is give the Word, and the Holy Spirit will bring the conviction. You could argue to the cows come home, and you're not going to convict a single person. That's not your job. It's the Holy Spirit's job. Much hard labor is often expended that is not called for. And that will never be appreciated. Time is lost in explaining points which are either self-evident or really unimportant and which would be taken for granted without proof. But while time should be spent on unnecessary and trifling arguments, the really vital points should be made as plain and forcible as language and proof can make them. We are arguing over here about this, that, and the other. And friends, listen. Did you know that Satan and his demons are bringing in spiritualism in such a way, in movies, in television, in sermons, and all these things, it's a binding link, all these world religions, whether they're Islam, whether they're Catholic, whether they're Pentecost or whatever it is, they all have a misunderstanding of the state of the dead, okay? And, and, and guess what, friends? When is the last time we had a big, huge movement within Adventism like they did in the 1800s to tell people that your dead loved ones are not going to come back and speak to you? And you know why this is so important? Because these are the spirits that go into all the world with all deceivableness, and if it were possible, they even deceive the very elect, yeah. and they're coming with a message saying that God has changed His law. Yeah. Don't you think that's really important? Yeah. Yeah. Friends, there's two chapters in the Great Controversy dealing with this, because at the end of the world, this is going to be the linchpin of Satan. 
Know ye not that you shall not surely die. Let me repeat this. The really vital points should be made as plain and forcible as language and proof can make them. So instead of spending our time arguing all these different points with those within our own people and those without, we should really be honing in on the really extra special ones and making them as plain and forcible as we possibly can. That's what we need to be spending our time on. Honing our skills to give the really important messages and make them as absolutely plain as we possibly can. She goes on to say, the most essential, what is essential? Important. Very Necessary. You know what essential, essential means life and death. Mm. The most important point. The most essential points of the Bible truth may be made indistinct by giving attention to every minute particular. In other words, we have a tendency to go so deep into explaining what these things mean. You know what happens? We're, 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 we're distracting people with our own words. Yeah, it's muddied. It's clouded. It is, we don't have to go over every point. Remember, we just go over the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit do the convicting. Some in their writings need to be constantly guarded, lest they make blind points that are plain in themselves by covering them up with many arguments which will not be of lively interest to the reader. I have to tell you, this is me. I, 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 I do like to read and I like to learn, but if somebody hands me uh, a, a, a study on something and it's lots of pages the chances of me reading it is slim to none it's just I don't if you're trying to make a point and do, whatever the point is right if you have three or four quotes or whatever that's good many arguments will not be the lively interest to the reader if they linger what is that? Tenaciously upon points? Tediously. Tediously. Upon points giving every particular which suggests itself to the mind, their labor will be nearly lost. For the interest of the reader will not be deep enough to lead him to pursue the subjects to its close. Because that's what we want to do. We want to bring them to a close on these topics. right? We don't want to just leave them hanging. Much ground may be covered, but the work upon which so much labor is expended is not calculated to do the greatest amount of good because it fails to awaken a general interest. In this age, when pleasing fables are drifting upon the surface and attracting the mind, do you hear what this is saying? In other words, there are these surfacey fables. They're not even rooted in any reality, but people are grasping onto them. They're surface. Attracting the mind. Truth presented in an easy style, backed up by a few strong proofs, is better and more effective than if its advocates were to search extensively and bring forth an overwhelming array of evidence. For the simple propositions do not then stand so clear and distinct in many minds as before the objections and evidences were brought before them. There are some who take many things for granted, and assertions will go further with them than long-labored arguments. And this is the, really the quote, as I continue reading, that I really love here. This is a busy world. And by the way, some of these, I have some of these quotes, and they will repeat some of the verbiage, but there's just different minutia here that I want you to see. This is a busy world. Is it a busy world, guys? I felt stressed just coming down here. <laughs> That's how busy it is. I mean, you know, it's busy. This is a busy world. Men and women who engage in the business of life have not time to meditate, 
nor even read the Word of God thoroughly enough to understand all of its important truths. Long, labored arguments will interest but few, for the people read as they run. It is better to keep a reserve of arguments and proof than to pour out a depth of knowledge on a subject that is in itself clear and plain. I've been saying this. I'm guilty of this. I know. But we need to, we need to put these things together and we need, to, we need to not have these long theses on the events leading the close of probation. They need to be short, to the point, easy to understand. The people will get them. The Holy Spirit will drive them home. Christ's ministry lasted only three years. This is kind of a little bit of a repeat. But a great work was done in that short period. In these days, there is also a great work to be done in a short time. And while many are getting ready to do something, souls will perish for want of light and knowledge. If men who are engaged in presenting and defending the truth of the Bible undertake to investigate the statements and show the fallacy, and this is again a little bit of a repeat, an inconsistency of men who dishonestly turn the truth of God into a lie, Satan will stir up opponents enough to keep their pens constantly employed while other branches of the truth of God will be left to suffer. And this is another way that Mrs. White uh, words this. It's almost the same, though. Said Nehemiah, when his enemies sought to entice him from his post of duty... Look what he says here. I am doing a great work. He believed it. We should too. So that I cannot come down. Bill has a statement a saying, stay on the wall. Go stand and speak. Stay on the wall. Why should the work cease? Whilst I leave it and come down to you. We, too, are doing a great work, and we cannot come down. This is what Ellen White says. We, too, are doing a great work, and we cannot come down, and we need more of the spirit of those men who were engaged in building the walls of Jerusalem. If Satan sees that he can keep men answering the objections of opponents and thus keep their voices silent and hinder them from doing the most important work of this time, he rejoices for his object is accomplished. And what is the most important job for this time? To get people ready for the events of the future, right? And the close of probation. And so here's what's happening. Because there's 20 different views out here on the events leading the close of probation, the church is not doing anything to give out the message because nobody agrees on what it is. This is again a sort of a repeat. It is a slightly different though. The world needs laborers now. No, get this, laborers now. These are workers for the Lord. And who gets a ticket out of here? Only the workers. Only the, workers. the world needs laborers now. From every direction is heard the Macedonian cry, come over and help us. Our success consists in reaching common minds. Plain, pointed arguments, standing out as mileposts, we will do more towards convincing people than will a large array of arguments which have which none but investigating minds will have interest to follow and if the laborers are pure in heart and life if they use to the glory of God the talents that he has committed to their keeping all of you have talents and they're all different and you need to take those talents and commit them to the work now Amen. don't wait they will have God on their side and heavenly angels to work with their efforts. Amen. Now, we're coming full circle. Because, friends, what I'm talking about us as a people doing has already been done. Mm -hmm. You see, the events that are leading to the close of probation, and we read that event 
to start out with, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, at that time, in the verse before that, is an event. And if you get that event wrong, you get the time wrong. And so, for over 70 years, the Seventh-day Adventist church didn't have all these different various views. It only endorsed one view. That's it, just one. And I want to show you what effect that view had. Because I believe if we do it again, it'll have the same effect. Listen to this. Review and Herald, September 6, 1877. Sunday morning, the weather was still cloudy. This is Ellen White speaking. The weather was still cloudy. Wasn't a good day to go out, but what happened? But before it was time for the people to assemble, the sun shone forth. Boats and trains poured their living freight upon the ground, as was the case last year. So they're in a place and they're having a meeting, and then a year later they're coming to the same place and having a meeting. So when the people were there last year, they heard what was talked about. Amen? And people had interest and brought friends the next year. Elder Smith spoke in the morning upon the Eastern question. Now, for those of you that might not know, the Eastern question deals with the last five or six verses of Daniel chapter 11 leading to the close of probation. This is the event that leads to the close of probation. And we titled it the Eastern Question. And what is the Eastern Question? Well, today, we might say the Middle Eastern Question. Because today, we call it the Middle East, but back in those days, they called it the East. And what is the question that's on the news? Fox News, CNN, ABC, every single day. What's going to happen over there? How is it all going to end? What's going to happen in Jerusalem? It's on the news every day. And friends, it was on the news every day then, too. And the newspapers referred to it as the Eastern Question. Let me repeat this again. Elder Smith spoke in the morning upon the Eastern Question. What year is this? 1877. He spoke in the morning upon the Eastern Question. The subject was of what? Special interest. What does special interest mean? So people are interested in hearing something, and if something is of special interest, it means set apart. It's special. It's why they want to come. The subject was of special interest, and the people listened with the most earnest attention. It seemed to be just what they wanted to hear. What did they want to hear? The Eastern question. Friends, listen, now I want to back up for a second here. In 1877, we were taking the message that theologians are saying you can't take to the public. You can't share these truths with the public because they're too deep, too complex, and you have to do this long series and massage into them this various criticistic techniques for them to be understand Scripture. And then only and only after you do all these things, then you can share it with the public after they've been indoctrinated in all these other points. Is this what's going on here, friends, yes or no? No. It's not going on here. So what they're doing is they're actually taking the events that lead to the close of human probation and they're using them as the tip of the spear. This is with the public. This is with the public. John Q. Public. It seemed to be just what they wanted to hear. Do you know what that means is they're announcing this, they're advertising this, and people are coming to the meetings because it was the special interest that brought them there, and it's what they came to hear. It's just what they wanted to hear. But let's look at the fruit of this message. In the afternoon, it was difficult for me to make my way to the desk through the standing crowd. 
Upon reaching it, a sea of heads was before me. The mammoth tent was fully seated, the seats having comfortable backs. They were all filled, yet thousands stood about the tent, making a living wall several feet deep. So there's thousands seated, and there are thousands standing. And there may be some standing at this meeting. Let's see. But it's going to take time to get back into the rhythm of giving this message the way they did. This is the fruit of the message, friends. Do you think that Ellen White would write all this down if the Eastern question was a false teaching? And this is what's being told to us today. They want us to totally forget that this was a statement by Ellen White. It's just what the people wanted to hear. Uh, Let me repeat this again. This is the fruit of the Spirit empowering this message. The mammoth tent. What does mammoth mean? That's a huge tent. And my understanding, some of these tents sat four or five thousand people, right? And then thousands standing. The mammoth tent was fully seated. And why was it fully seated? What was it that they came there to hear? The Eastern question. The mammoth tent was fully seated. The seats having comfortable backs. Note to self. These were all filled Yet thousands stood about the tent, making a living wall several feet deep. No fire department. That is what we need. And that message does that work. You understand what I'm saying? Because then we can go over to people and say, this is how it's going to end in the Middle East, friends. These are the events that lead to the close of probation. And there's a specific event that when you see it on the horizon, you can know that Jesus is coming soon and that your probation is about to close. Get your ticket. Get in that book. Because there's no other way out of this thing. A time of trouble, trouble such as never was since there is a nation, is right upon us. Fall on the rock, confess your sins, into the most holy place while there's still time. Friends, listen, don't let anybody ever tell you that this is not the third angel's message. Because listen, friends, listen. The third angel's message is tied to the sanctuary message. Amen? Amen. And the sanctuary message is tied to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, when probation closes. And the Eastern question is tied to that because it's telling us when probation's going to end. Listen to this. This is another statement, very similar. This is from the new release, the new writings. LT10A. Sunday forenoon, Elder Smith spoke upon the Eastern question. Just the subject, and I like this because in the other one she says it one way and now she's saying it this way. Just the subject the people wish to hear. The cars and three steamboats were pouring the living freight upon the ground until we thought that there were nearly as many as last year, and indeed there were more attentive listeners than last year, the mammoth tent was well seated with backs to the seats. And she mentions that again. (laughs) Must be important. (laughs) So let me just say this once again. I had made a statement that if we had these meetings on the Eastern question in modern times, and we compared them with other people's alternative ending, okay? What you would have is, see, the Holy Spirit would attend the meeting if it's true, right? So if you had 500 people the first night and you had a second meeting on the same subject, you would have 1,000 people or 1,500 people if the Spirit attended it because they would go home and they would tell all their friends, you got to come and hear this message, right? This is what happened. This is what happened here, because listen to this. We thought, what is she saying here? Well, we thought that there were as nearly many as last year, and indeed there were more attentive listeners than last year. You see what I'm saying? Now, let's see. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Mrs. White would be traveling around with these men 
that are teaching this topic if it was false doctrine? That's ridiculous, friends. That's absolutely nonsense. It is the truth. And here's her saying it. Now, what, what year is this right here? 1877. And this one right here is 1884. How many years later is that? Now, Mrs. White is still traveling around with these men teaching the Eastern question thing. And let me tell you something. Mrs. White has some very, very blistering statements to say to men who brought in false doctrine into the Advent faith. Did you know that? Yes. But here it is many years later, and listen to what she says. The evening meeting was largely attended. Second witness right here, friends. Elder Smith spoke with great clearness and many listened with open eyes, ears, and what? Mouths. This is what it looks like. <laughs> open eyes, ears, and mouths. The outsiders, who are they? They're not Adventists. The outsiders seem to be intently interested in the Eastern question. He closed with a very solemn address to those who had not been preparing for the great events in the near future. Do you really think, friends, listen, I'm going to just make a public statement here. I feel impressed by the Spirit. Friends, do you really believe that Mrs. White, for a period of over six years, let, let me do the math here, seven years, would be traveling around with a group of people that are teaching this message called the Eastern Question and giving comments like this if it was false. And what's happening? It's what they wanted to hear. This is why they came to the meeting. This brought them out. And he's talking to who? outsiders and notice how he's doing it notice how he's doing it he spoke with great clearness and many listened with open eyes ears and mouths the outsiders seemed to be intensely interested in the eastern question he closed with a very solemn address and you know why it was solemn because he's saying this is how it's going to end and friends what's the next event close of human probation that's a solemn message now, listen to this. God alone can make the impression and give the increase. Did you hear that? Amen. No matter what I say or do, it's not me. God alone can make the impression and give the increase. He alone can water the seed that has been sown. I pray to the Lord that the labor put forth may not be in vain. Many seem to feel deeply. We feel and think and praise God that this large number, third witness, could have a chance to hear the what? Truth for themselves. Dr. Corot is now speaking at 5 o'clock p.m. PM upon the health question. Elder Daniel speaks this evening upon what? Eastern. The Eastern question. May the Lord give His Holy Spirit to inspire the hearts to make the truth plain. Wow. Yeah. Years now we're in 1898. We started when? 1877. How many years later is that? 1898. 21. 21, years. 21 years later. Her... 21 years later, friends, her song hasn't changed. She still sang, it's amazing, it's amazing the large numbers of people that are coming out to hear the truth, and it's amazing that, that, that they want to come and hear this Eastern question. And then, she, and then she prays to the Lord, may the Lord give His Holy Spirit to inspire the hearts to make the truth plain. I don't even need to give any more evidence. I just gave three or four quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy testifying, listen friends, testifying not only that the Eastern question is the truth, 
but testifying that it was unbelievably interesting and that it brought out large groups of people. And using terms like dumping out human cargo, thousands standing, not a seat in the house. Isn't that the kind of thing we want to do? Amen. Over a 20-year period, she's saying this. What did they actually say? Oh. What did they actually say that cut their attention? Well, it's the Eastern question. Because, see, we use the title Eastern question because the newspapers use the title. So when, you, when the people would read their newspapers, there would be these headlines all the time, the Eastern question, what's going to happen? How's this going to end? What's Turkey going to do next? This was the main thing. And so we would take that same headline and we would use it and say, okay, this is what's going to happen. The Bible says it. And people were like, wow, that's amazing. The burden of the warning now to come to the people of God, nigh and afar off, is the third angel's message. And those who are seeking to understand this message will not be led by the Lord to make an application of the word that will undermine the foundation and remove the pillars of faith that has made Seventh-day Adventists what they are today. The truths, and remember she called the Eastern question what? Truth. Truth. The truths that have been unfolding in their order as we have advanced along the line of prophecy revealed in the word of God are truth, sacred, eternal truth today. Friends, do you realize the ground that we're on as a people, as a church, when the prophet says this is truth? that that truth is attended by the Holy Spirit and that thousands come out to hear it. And then at the end of the world today, where we are, we're saying eeny, meeny, miny, mo, which one is truth? That's what we're doing. But she says here that the truths that have been unfolding in their order as we have advanced along the line of prophecy revealed in the word of God are truth, sacred, eternal truth today. Absolutely. Friends, listen. We can't say that what was true in 1877 and 1884 and 1898 and then kick it to the side and say it's no longer truth. That's no foundation. I'm going to repeat part of this again. And those who are seeking to understand this message will be... Listen, friends, I want you to listen very carefully to this because this is important. This is unbelievably important because there are lots of people out here saying this, that, and the other, right? Notice what she says here, second sentence. And those who are seeking to understand this message will not be led by the Lord to make an application of the word that will undermine the foundation and remove the pillars of the faith that has made Seventh-day Adventists what they are today. Friends, if a person comes in, if a book comes in, if a message comes in and says, this is new light, this is the truth, and it undermines our foundations, God's not in it. Because God laid these foundations, and He's not going to undermine His own foundations. Amen? Amen. Those who passed over the ground step by step in the past history of our experience, seeing the chain of truth in the prophecies, were prepared to accept and obey every ray of light. They were praying, fasting, searching, digging for the truth as for hidden treasures. And the Holy Spirit we knew. Who? The Holy Spirit. We knew was teaching and guiding us. What leads us into the truth? The Holy Spirit. Many theories were advanced bearing a semblance of truth but so mingled with misinterpreted and misapplied scriptures that they led to dangerous errors. 
Very well do we know how every point of truth was established and the seal set upon it by the Holy Spirit of God. And all the time voices were heard, here is the truth, I have the truth, follow me. But the warning came, go not ye after them. I have not sent them, but they ran. Listen, friends. According to this right here, what is it that leads us into the truth? Holy the Holy Spirit. And what led the spirit of prophecy? The Holy Spirit. So who led Mrs. White to make these statements and call the Eastern question truth? The Holy Spirit. And so listen, this is what she's saying. All the time voices were heard, here's the truth. I have the truth. Follow me. Did it go along with what the truth that had been laid? No. And here we are, our foundation, our men, our men of experience, those who had an experience through the 1844 time period, who dearly paid a price, believe these truths, and now here we're saying, no, 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 that's not the truth, this is the truth. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. The leadings of the Lord were marked. Friends, listen. Leadings of the Lord are marked, and most wonderful were his revelations of what is truth. Point after point was established by the Lord God of heaven. That which was truth then is truth today. But the voices do not cease to be heard. This is truth. I have new light. But these new lights in prophetic lines are manifest in misapplying the word and setting the people of God adrift without an anchor to hold them. And here's where we are. We're adrift. You can pick this ending. Here's the book. Here's all these endings. You pick which one. Is that what we really want to be as a people? Or do we want to be united around the truths that God led us step by step by step and that we can give a message and we can give it directly to the people. We don't have to massage some philosophy into them for them to be able to understand. We present the word of God just as it reads. The Holy Spirit attends it. And friends, I promise you, listen, Every seat in the house will be filled and thousands will be standing and their eyes and their ears and their mouths will be open. If the student of the word would take the truths which God has revealed in the leadings of his people, and we're already told, friends, that Mrs. White said the Eastern question is truth. If the student of the word would take the truths which God has revealed in the leadings of his people and appropriate these truths, digest them, bring them into their practical life, they would then be living channels of light. But those who have set themselves to study out new theories have a mixture of truth and error combined. And after trying to make these things prominent, have demonstrated that they have not kindled their taper for the divine altar, and it has gone out in darkness. Friends, this is why our message is not powerful like it was when these messages were given in the past here in the United States. Why? Because we have combined our own theories, we've put aside these truths that were established, and we've taken up this supposed new channels of light, and we have combined it with truths, like the Sabbath and other things, but the Lord is not empowering the message. You understand what I'm saying? He's not empowering these uh, uh, errors and truth combination thing. The whole company of believers were united in the truth. Did you hear that? The whole company of believers were, past tense, united in the truth. They were those who came in with strange doctrines, but we were never afraid to meet them. Our experience was wonderfully established by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. But if our labors bear the impress of the Spirit of God, if a higher divine power attends our efforts to sow the gospel seed, we shall see fruits of our labor to the glory of God. He alone can water the seed. So friends, listen, if we're giving the truth, if it is truth, what is it going to do? 
it's going to bear fruit. It's going to bear fruit. And this is what I'm saying. This is what I'm urging our leaders to do this October. Don't say eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Don't do that. Don't pick the one that you like the best. How do you do it? You look at the message that the Spirit has attended. Amen? And you look at how it's bearing a harvest. It's reaping souls. It's it, Friends, listen. If the truth is truth, the events leading the close of probation are going to do these things. Their eyes, their ears, and their mouth is going to be hanging open. And if the message can't do that, and it's not based on God's word, it's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. Listen to this, 2SM 189, paragraph 2. When this work is done as it should be, when we labor with divine zeal to add converts to the truth, the world will see that a power attends the message of truth. The unity of the believers bears testimony to the power of the truth that can bring into perfect harmony men of different dispositions, making their interests one. Right now, friends, how can the Lord bless our work on a worldwide level when we are not in unity, when we're not speaking the same things, but here it says, the unity of the believers bears testimony to the power of the truth. We do need to come together on this issue, and we do need to preach the events leading the close of probation so that we can warn people and get their name into the book. Amen? Amen. But if we don't do it in unity, there's not going to be any power in it. Friends, Keep this in prayer. We're at a very pivotal time in the history of this nation, of this church, and of this world. And events are rapidly being fulfilled. Events that our pioneers, through studying the Word of God, foresaw. The events surrounding what's going to take place in Jerusalem, and I'm talking about literal Jerusalem, literally over in the Middle East, what's going to happen in that city, and around that region, leading up to the close of probation, these are events that people can see, they can hear, and they can understand, and they can, they can understand very quickly and very plainly. You understand what I'm saying? They'll see it, they'll get it, and they'll be convicted from Scripture and Scripture alone and through the outpouring of His Holy Spirit uh, as to what the truth is, and this movement and this truth will advance to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But friends, we have to do it the way the Lord has inspired us. And we can't tear up the foundations, and we can't rip down the pillars, and we can't take Mrs. White and say, well, that was truth for her, but it's not truth for me. That's dangerous. And friends, let me just say this. It really just makes the best sense. It, this scripture that the pioneers interpreted just plain makes the best sense. Amen. It does. Amen. It's easy for people to see. Everybody believes that the events that are transpiring over the Middle East are prophetic. And all the world is watching Jerusalem. It's a tug of war between Christianity and Islam and the Jews over the control of this city and over what happens to it. And friends, the Bible tells us the events that happens in that city just before the close of probation. And we need to take it to the world and we need to start doing it now. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, You've told us through your prophet that the events leading to the close of probation are clearly revealed, plainly and clearly revealed, but multitudes are walking in darkness as if they never have been. Lord, they've been plainly and clearly revealed to us as a people, as a church, but we have accepted various other theories and ideas and we're adrift without a compass, without an anchor to hold us 
into place. And Lord, I just lift up our people, I lift up our leaders, that we would make a decision to stand upon the truth as it was laid by those who paid dearly with an experience, with their lives, with their, with their income, with their goods, with everything they had, to take this truth far and wide. And in a short time, a great work was done, and thousands, thousands, Lord, came and flocked to these meetings. It can happen again, Lord. I pray that each one of us would commit our talents, whatever they are, to this work of taking this message to all the world. In Jesus' name, amen.